the bow and arrow as a projectile weapon had been known for some time. There are indications that its earliest use may have been 15,000 BC. Ever since that time, the bow and arrow has gone through periods of resurgence and disuse. I would like to cover the period 1200 to 1450 AD and focus on two competing bow arrow projectile systems, the longbow and the crossbow. The crossbow was first seen in about 400 BC and was a direct descendant of the gastrofeet, a Greek siege weapon. By the 1200s, it was an individual weapon and could be carried and manipulated by one man. However, it was still powerful with draw weights running from hundreds up to thousands of pounds. The draw weights were so heavy that the shooter required either a winch, like this one in the West Point Museum, or a rack and pinion affair called a craniquin, like this one in the Kulmbach Museum, in order to cock the weapon. This obviously decreased the volume of fire. Though the bolt which it fired was aerodynamically efficient, the crossbow was quite short-ranged. The abrupt acceleration of the crossbow generally disturbed the launch of the bolt and hurt its accuracy. Further, since the shooter placed the crossbow up in front of his face in order to aim and fire, he had no real ability to aim over the target as the range increased. However, the crossbow did one thing very, very well. It penetrated the chain mail armor of the armored horseman. The competing projectile system was the longbow. Longbow was a straight, simple bow. It had no fancy recurves, and it was composed of one piece. There was no horn or gut like a compound bow. It fired the legendary cloth yard shaft, an arrow roughly 30 or 31 inches long. These arrows fell into two types. The flight arrow, which was basically a light shafted arrow designed for firing at long range, say from 100 to 240 yards, much like this modern broadhead. And the sheaf arrow, a very heavy shafted arrow with a very sharp pyramidal point. This sheaf arrow could range up to 120 yards and was specifically designed for the penetration of armor. In our example today, the crossbow that we'll be firing is much less powerful than a real war crossbow of the 1200s. In our case, it is cocked by use of a goat's foot lever. This lever is placed in a ring at the front of the crossbow and the foot of the lever is then placed against the drawstring. The crossbow is braced against the body and the string is drawn to the rear. The bowstring is then held in place by what we would call today a sear. The goat's foot is then taken off and a bolt is placed in a trough in front of the bowstring. Upon pressing the trigger, which was simply a lever mounted behind the tiller or the long part of the crossbow, the bowstring would lurch forward, launching the arrow into flight. When you see this weapon in action, please remember that it has only one-third the power of a real war bow of the 1200s. This means that its range, 30 or 40 yards, would be about one-third that which a real war crossbowman would have gotten. However, because it is so much easier to cock with that goat's foot, its volume of fire will be roughly double what a crossbowman of that day and age would have attained. The longbow worked in a relatively simple manner. The shooter placed the knock of his arrow on the bowstring and laid the shaft of the arrow over his left hand, which held the bow at the belly. He then hooked two or three fingers over the bowstring, straddling the arrow. Drawing the string back to the hinge of his jaw, he then aimed at the enemy and released.
our longbow is much closer to what they were using at the time. We believe it to have had about two-thirds the power of what a real war longbow would have had at that time. Therefore, its range will be a bit less, but its volume of fire will be almost exactly the same. Our chart reflects the best historical evidence which is available to us. It is quite obvious that the longbow outranges the crossbow by better than two to one and has a much higher volume of fire. It would seem then that the longbow would be the obvious choice. However, the chart does not tell everything. At the longer ranges, the longbow would be using the flight arrow, which is not necessarily an armor penetrator. It would certainly penetrate normal clothing or leather, but would not penetrate chain mail. Also at the longer ranges, though hits can be obtained, the angle of fall is quite steep and the velocity greatly reduced. The longbow has one other grave disadvantage in relation to the crossbow. A crossbowman can be trained in a short period of time, and he need not keep his weapon with him constantly. It could be issued by the king or by a baron immediately prior to going off to war. This is not true of the longbow. The longbow came to England from Wales in roughly 1190 AD. In any other place or time, the longbow would probably not have borne fruit and simply died away. But in England at that time, with its free yeomanry, its trust of the common citizenry, the Magna Carta, plus the fact that it was an insular society, the longbow took root. The longbow was a difficult weapon to master, required training from a very young age, and took constant practice in order to retain shooting skills. At least seven years were required for the training of a combat-ready longbowman. The tales we remember as children of Robin Hood and the county fairs and Maid Marian and the Merry Men and so forth were based in fact. The fairs were sponsored by the king as a means of instituting longbow practice. This could not have happened in any other society. Lastly, remember that the longbowman, once trained, became a valuable commodity that could not be squandered. Beyond these problems, both the crossbow and the longbow suffered another disadvantage. They both were extremely vulnerable during the loading process. A longbowman or a crossbowman could not wear much armor and still operate his weapon, nor could he carry shock weapons with him like this broadsword or this mace and still carry his longbow or crossbow, the bolts, arrows, and so forth. Further, when he commenced to fire, he normally was rooted to the spot. He either had to lay his arrows out in front of him, string his longbow and get ready to fire, or in the case of the crossbowman, he had to lay out his bolts and then get his cocking mechanism ready. Therefore, they were not mobile, and if they were attacked at close range, they basically had no method of defending themselves. Consequently, the longbow and the crossbow were either defensive weapons fired from the inside of a castle, or, if used in the open field, other people had to be nearby in order to defend them. Further, longbowmen and crossbowmen, if they knew battle was coming, frequently placed sharpened stakes in the ground in front of them as a method of stopping the charge of the armored horseman before the horseman's lance could be brought to bear. Remember that the longbow and the crossbow were in their heyday just prior to the resurgence of trained formations of infantry armed with the pike. Consequently, the protection for the longbowman and the crossbowman was not necessarily well coordinated in the 1200s 
and early 1300s. It is of course true that the longbow performed very, very well in the early stages of the Hundred Years' War, racking up great victories at Crecy, Agincourt, and Poitiers. These victories were primarily due to the longbow's combat range and volume of fire. However, the leaders of the day understood the preparation and the other actions required on their part in order to gain the benefit from the longbow while shielding themselves from its weaknesses. The English kings, particularly Edward I and Edward III, had gone to great lengths in an attempt to come up with a tactical system for using the longbow in combat. In what Dr. Ira D. Gruber calls the English home games, the English fought many battles, such as Falkirk and Halidon Hill against the Scots, where they perfected their tactics before they went to the away games against the French. In fact, the Battle of Halidon Hill against the Scots in 1333 is almost a mirror image of the Battle of Crecy against the French in 1346. In modern terms, we would say that these weapons had advantages and disadvantages, and for them to be effective on the battlefield, the leader had to understand each weapon's strengths and weaknesses and weave these into his tactical organization and his battle plan in order to maximize upon the advantages and protect himself from the weaknesses. It may have been a long time, to go, long time ago, but crude or stupid, it wasn't. The leaders devoted a great deal of thought on how to incorporate these weapons into a winning team and we expect nothing less of you today. The preceding was a television presentation of the Audiovisual Instructional Technology Division, United States Military Academy.